Yeah. Are you more Star Trek than Star Wars? Um, probably more Star. Well, I used to be more Star Star Wars than Star Trek, but I'm probably more Star Trek these days. I'm more Star Trek. Yeah. Q uh, is on Star Trek Picard. Yeah, I was in season, season two. two of Picard. Yeah. Also uh, named after a character on Star Trek. Q. Well, I like to think he's named after me, but yeah. However, you want to do it. it's funny because I did a. Uh, 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 my buddy was doing a Star Trek con, so I went. And I sat down at the table, and they made a sign that said the other Q. Oh, that's funny. So you guys have known each other for a long time, and, and I'm surprised that like that specific conversation has never come up at any point. Oh, it has. We've forgotten half the things we've said. <laughs> We're just two, two crabs in a bucket. <laughs> two crabs in a bucket. Are you just like interview marathon today, going from one place to another? Say marathon. Uh, it's more of like a steady jog, not a full yeah. 27 yeah. two. Like a 5K. It's more like a 5K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a charity 5K that nobody's really in it for the, like the gusto. You know, that's kind of what it is. To prepare, I was watching some interviews with, uh, l- l- largely with the group. And I was thinking about how each time you sit down for an interview, you probably have no idea what to, <laughs> what to expect in far, as far as like how serious the interviewer right. is going to take it. I, I am fascinated. You've said something already that we've never, never thought about or – uh, in 14 years of TV, What's that? you sat down to prepare. For, <laughs> like, I've never heard that. Like, I wonder, do people prepare to interview us? I don't know why. That blows mean, my mind. Yeah. Here's my trick after having done this a very long time is that at very least you should listen to or watch an interview with the person. So you know how like they sure. respond to questions. But I, I'm curious because, like, you know, I'm sure that it. I'm sure that like a lot of them have like a fairly like jokey term. But every once in a while, you'll sit down and somebody will want to get like super serious. Probably. What What did you glean from your preparations? <laughs> well, what What takeaway did you have? You seem like very genuine and like genuinely like the two of you specifically. I was like, oh, these guys are smart. Hi, all right. Uh, these are it. two. These are these are two smart guys. You have done your research. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I, I, you know, with you specifically, I got the uh, impression that you are, are well read, but maybe it have some difficulty um, actually expressing that. Is that a fair assessment? It's just a speech impediment. I don't know why everybody's got to bring it up. <laughs> you are the best read out of all. Of I read a lot. I read yeah. a lot. Tell me what's wrong with me. <laughs> that was a compliment. I, I think, well, I, I listen, like, so I watched the Dom Herrera interview oh, um, wow. from God, what, like nine years ago now. And, and you were really, um, you had your feet to the fire because of the use of the word tableau. So, it, like, the two of you kind of have the opposite. Yeah, I was a big tableau guy. He was dropping tableau left and right for, like, six months. Do you know once every five months Dom Herrera calls me? But I'm always in the, like, uh, like I'll be in the pool. Really? And my phone rings from Dom Herrera. Or I'm, like, making love to my wife yeah. and the phone rings from Dom Herrera. He right. knows. He just, he well, knows. I will at some point. Yeah, I love I've just that. always been – I just make a lot of love. I never get to call him back. When was the last time you talked to him? Oh, I thought you were going to say was the last time you did love. First question for a second and then we'll we'll do each question one at a time. Sure. So first – last time you talked to him and then last time you made love. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to text him right now. It's been at least a year. Oh, well, he's on LA time. He's not going to – he's up at 7.50 in the morning. Well, he uh, doesn't have the answer right now. We'll just call him then. No. All right. No. Uh, last time I spoke to him, he's like 75, so like old people get up early, right? That's Isn't racist. That... That's <laughs> racist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, that, maybe about a year ago, the last time I spoke yeah. to him. But a great guy. Yeah, and the last guy. time we made love, uh, about a year ago. Yeah. Same, same answer. Called that at, at that exact moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the reason why you haven't spoken <laughs> in a while is you've been, <laughs> you've been going through a drought. But it was interesting, like specifically from that interview, because I felt like the two of you, you know, like had had – the opposite problems with specifically with the word tableau that you were sort of going out of your way to use a, I mean, you regretted it the next day. It seemed like you felt like an asshole for use, having used the word tableau in a casual conversation. It was fun. Cause then we all, we all like, it's become a regular part of, but you were high on tableau. I was, I was so Sal is high. We're all high on words. I remember the time you dropped tableau on us where we all started laughing. We were in LA and we were driving, uh, 
to CIA at the time. Yeah. And you said something about Tableau. We were like, did you just say Tableau? And I said it. And I owned it. Yeah. yeah. And then it was a few weeks where we were, we were all on about Tableau, but we, now we use it. We are, we're all hot on certain. You go through phases, right? Yeah. Uh, Sal's been hot on the unmitigated gall phase for yeah, a long time. Sal went through the, how do we solve for this? Oh, he, yes, how do we solve for this? And what's the other one he uses all the time still to this day? Um, uh, get away from me. I don't care if you're a fan. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But how do we solve for this is a little bit marketing speech. It's a little bit like we'll circle back to that. Yeah, I don't know who or, taught it to Sal, but he started saying it out of nowhere Yeah, yeah recently. <laughs> Was Tableau specifically, is that part of your television background? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, we've got time. We won't talk about this the entire time. But I want to get to the bottom of sure what the question is. But a tableau is a common word. It's a word that it's can be used that common. in daily conversation. Yeah. I use it all the time. Yeah, that doesn't mean it's common. You know, doing the job that you were doing at the time, whether that influenced your vocabulary, because obviously you were now working on both sides of the camera. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't think I ever used it in the TV development days. You don't go into no. a pitch meeting and be like, so this is a tableau. You, know? you got to dumb it down for people. You got to dumb it down. Yeah. yeah. We're supposed to talk about the Radio City Music Hall we show, which is... You, yeah. you We're played... not supposed to do anything. This is... We, this is oh, I was told specifically that we have to talk about the Radio City We're Music a little shaky because we just survived an earthquake. I don't know if you heard about that. Oh, yeah, I'm in Queens. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. Did you feel it? I, I, you know, I don't know if it's because I'm from California, but everyone was texting me about it. I was like, I no, <laughs> you're just did you're not notice it at all. California. Yeah. You guys seem to have gotten through it pretty well. It was terrifying. Like things were falling off the walls and stuff like that. Uh, people were like tripping and stuff. It was kind of scary over here. We're in Manhattan right now. Wait, are you being serious? Things are like literally. Yeah. Yeah. It was nuts. Yeah. It was pretty crazy. We got off the elevator and like the elevator started hitting a little bit and we got out and then people were uh, kind of running around with chicken with their heads uh, yeah, it was uh, uh, dogs and cats living in together. Mass hysteria. <laughs> Fueling the pink slime underneath the city. <laughs> it's well, because I remember the last time, because I've, he- I've been here for like close to 20 years at this point. I remember the last time there was like a big enough er- earthquake to be notable. Like I remember exactly where I was. It's that rare in New York City that it's like, triangulate that moment that it happened to you. Yeah, yeah it's like the Kennedy assassination. Yeah. Like, you know where you when you're, yeah, when he was killed, we weren't born yet, though. We were not, but my father. So you didn't know where you were, in a sense. He was running alongside the uh, the motorcade. Your father claimed he was. My father uh, met JFK on Fulton Street in Manhattan when he was a serviceman. Oh wow! And JFK got out of, I mean, several weeks before he died, uh, got out of his motorcade and shook servicemen's hands and shook my father's hand on Fulton Street. And my father, in his late last years of life warped the story to being that he was running alongside the motorcade in dallas wow yeah that's a pretty common thing that 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 sort of conflation with the the things that you went through and like in pop culture it seems like it makes me wonder what are we going to conflate or uh what tableaus will we create in our minds Mm -hmm. (laughs) probably something involving making love to dom herrera would be my (laughs) guess (laughs) <laughs> I'm probably shortchanging people, but a lot of times it's it's it seems like it's a result of like having maybe not have had that many experiences that people would classify as notable. So you conflate them with the things that you've seen on television. But like you've the last, you know, 15 plus years of your lives have been pretty remarkable from where I'm sitting. Yeah, I think so. We got to do a lot of cool stuff with each other. Yeah, a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. I wonder how I'm going to warp that. You know, what if this? What if you're lying in bed right now and this is all a memory? It could. I, I arrived early this morning when we started press, and I had a half hour to kill, and I fell asleep in the car. I lay down flat, and I had. This could be part of that dream. Maybe I am still in the car on Sixth Avenue. You got to update your dreams if this is what you're dreaming. <laughs> of. Sitting in a conference room on a podcast. Well, yeah, like my dreams have like Samantha Fox from 1988. <laughs> Running around, yeah. This is I, so it would be like this, but I'd be slightly more attractive. I mean, my dream is pretty epic, though. I just caused a, uh, an earthquake in yeah. New York, New Jersey. That's an epic dream, man. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You stick with Samantha Fox. I'm I'm shaking the world. In my I'm place. okay with that trade off. Okay. At this point, after so many years, it, it, do you still have surreal moments? Oh yeah, all the time, man. It, it kind of like it's funny because I. 
was given was putting together a package for a charity thing, and I, I was signing our action figures for them to auction sure. off. And I was like crazy. It was like, oh wow, we have three three action figures. Yep. We, they made Halloween costumes out of us. Like yep. it was all weird stuff. It, it you know what? It's cool. Like when you first hear about it, and then you kind of forget about it. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's that's the way life is. This is true. Yeah. This is true. You sort of have to have those moments where you can sort of step back for a moment and realize how. We, we do have moments like that. The moments yeah. for me, uh, not to answer a question seriously, but I will, uh, Madison Square Garden. Yeah. There's that moment. Uh, I took the subway from my apartment downtown, got out of the subway, and Madison Square Garden said, in Bracken Jokers. Yeah. And I literally had tears streaming around my face. The first time we stepped on stage at Radio City Musical. Yeah, that was big. Um, was a huge moment. Yeah. I remember standing on stage, seeing the, the audience for the first time in the crowd. Yeah. And just, I mean, tears. We were all, for two minutes, we couldn't talk. Yeah, yep. it was cool. Yep. Like the Ryman Theater in uh, the Nashville Ryman. was great. was yeah. a big one, yeah. Yeah, the Greek Theater. That was my favorite show we ever did. I was just talking about that last yeah. night. Because Tim Robinson from I Think You Should Leave is playing the Greek. Oh, yeah? Out. Yeah. Yeah, it's my favorite show we ever did. We had a great time. Me too. I mean, Radio City being a hometown venue for you, there's probably like old Madison Square Garden, obviously, as well. But there's something like next level about that. Not just yeah. this huge historic place, but... Being in effectively your hometown. Yeah, I mean, I saw those Rockettes when I was a kid there. You know, yeah. Uh, I mean? Did you know the story? Of the last time I was before we got on stage at Radio City, the last time I was in Radio City, no, it was like twenty years ago. I went as a kid, of course, see the Rockettes, the whole thing. But twenty years ago, maybe nineteen ninety eight, ninety nine, I snuck into a David Copperfield show at Radio City, and then hung around and you know skulked about. And got into his meet and greet, and uh, there was a meet and greet of like eight people. How in old City. Are you? I was in college. I was tw- a junior, so twenty one, I guess, right. or junior, and snuck into the meet and greet and met him in wow. the late nineties. And now you have his number. And now I have his number. And he won't answer my calls. Yeah, well, that's because of what. Do you have David Copperfield's number? He does. I do. And then we we took his phone one time and started we're calling him or texting him or pretending uh, we were you. Well, you tried to get me to leave him a voicemail, but he picked up the phone. Oh, that was it. Everyone froze. We didn't realize it was his cell phone number. I thought it was yeah. his office number. <laughs> and then I prank called David Copperfield live on the radio. <laughs> Are you friendly with him? Is, were you able to explain the situation? Not anymore. Not since uh, – no, Okay. I told him. No. He, he knew who you were at the time and then has cut you off since the, the prank. No. Yeah. Did he ever give you a free ticket to the show? Uh, I got free tickets and then got a free meet and greet pass to a show in Vegas. So I have, to this day, never paid to see him perform. Nice, nice. One was a total sc- – they were both scams. Nice. <laughs> One is a – you know. Yeah. Maybe that's actually the source of the friction between the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, obviously there's something about playing like a Madison Square Garden or, or Radio City. Do you feel like you need to sort of up it to the next level? Is there something that you need to bring to shows like that? When you're playing a venue that's that venerated or historic, you want to make sure you have a good show. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, you know, it's. I mean, we kind of always do what we do. We're, we're we're doing something new with this tour where we're 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 punishing Sal on stage, <laughs> like live on stage, and we bring up someone from the audience to uh, to to. Well, we just spoil it, right? Yeah, might as well. Yeah, we put shock collars that we have Sal wear on the show sometimes. And we have him wear him on stage, and we bring uh, someone up from the audience to control the buttons to shock him while he tries to tell a story about his Jaden Smith tattoo. So that just brings down the house every night. <laughs> yeah. It's, people like watching Sal suffer. <laughs> I get the sense that there's always has to be like this es- escalation that happens. But um, after this many years, like, is there a point that you get to where there's got to be a point where you can't cross, right? <laughs> Uh, I think the show will end one day when you know one of us just dies. Yeah, yeah. Kill each other somehow. In, in, in the Impractical Jokers movie that came out uh, about twenty minutes before COVID hit uh, in theaters, uh, I lose the movie and I had to fly outside of an airplane. And uh, the only way they would ensure the movie and let us film it is if we film that punishment on the final day. That way, if I died doing it, they could still release the movie. Yeah. There'd just be a little like shot of you at the beginning of the movie, <laughs> just like an in memoriam. How did you guys get through COVID? How did that impact your shooting schedule? Uh, well, you know, we, it's hard to make a hidden camera show, um, you know, when you're not allowed to stand in near any people. So we were down for a little bit, a few months, yeah. And then, and then when we came back, you know, they had all these rules about like shooting uh, TV shows, 
and all of them were like, we can't make a hidden camera show with these rules that you guys are, are doing. But we figured it out. We, we basically built a studio in New Jersey. Remember that? That college campus? Yeah, you want That college <laughs> campus. Uh, and we, we, turned, we, we took over this college campus and turned it into different looks and invited people there. They had multiple buildings on campus and houses and things like that. And yeah. the campus was empty. So we were able to, for months, we shot almost exclusively there and did focus groups and all sorts of taste yeah. tests and everything you want. We did a psychic experiments, you know, because they had all the science right. lab. They had all these great set pieces, yeah. essentially. And people thought it was legit because they're going to a college campus and it was all impractical jokers. It was it was a weird time to shoot because we never get that experience of going to the same place for work every no, day. And, and it, it was, was 25 cool. minutes from my yeah, house. It was the it was best good. season ever. It was good because everybody, Warner Brothers put out this rule that everybody that appears on one of their shows – has to have been tested. And we were like, well, we can't shoot in Manhattan and have a person walking down the street. We don't know if they've been tested or not. So we had to create a situation where we could test them before they got in to see us. Yeah, it worked out well. And then we, we created a show during that time called Dinner Party, uh, Rocker Joker's Dinner Party. My favorite thing we ever did. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. I love that. Was it fun. was like us having dinner on Zoom together. We recorded it, recorded it, and put it on TV. Uh, when we couldn't shoot jokers, and uh, we had a blast. It was so much fun. The surprises were great. That yeah, we, you know. Yeah, we had uh, Ed Harris on, right? Ed Harris and uh, Jeff Daniels. Jeff Daniels. We had Patty Jenkins came on. Uh-huh. We had oh, Colin yeah. Jones. Yeah, we had tons of people on. Yeah, uh, and I loved that show. That was us at our like most purest. I would love to do it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I would love to do it again. Yeah, that's something I hadn't considered. It's something I talk to about uh, musicians and writers a lot are the power of is the power of constraints. You know, um, working within a certain certain confines can actually make you more creative because you have to find creative ways through it. And it sounds like that was very similar to your experience during COVID. Well, one of my favorite punishments in show history was because of COVID. Uh, we couldn't film in person with people, what have you. So we created this uh, punishment idea where there's a bunch of kids in the classroom on Zoom. Uh, they were like seven, eight-year-old kids that thought that they were Zooming into the International Space Station and they were going <laughs> to be talking to an astronaut. And... Uh, we built this set piece in a, in a, you know, a warehouse of a capsule that looked like the space station, and I was rigged up to this to the capsule, and the whole capsule rotated. The camera was fixed, and the camera would rotate with me. So the kids thought I was hovering upside down, but I wasn't. I was the camera just down. rotated with me, so there was still gravity on Earth. And I'm showing them how things are done in space, like eating uh, spaghetti or drinking milk, and it's falling upward instead of down. I'm just upside down on set. So much fun. Pra- you were pranking children, though. <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's got to be heartbreaking for them, right? So once once they realize, yeah, it, sounds like their it does seem like their problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was that's not even the worst one we did with a kid, right? The worst one was the turtle eggs. Oh my they go, god! So they got this music, children's museum on Staten Island, and they go just go in that room. And just do whatever we told you. So I didn't know idea what was going on. I get in a room and there's all these kids in front of me and there's all these chicken eggs. And they're going, slam the chicken eggs on your head. And we told the kids they were like uh, endangered Endang- turtle eggs. Endangered turtle and the turtles eggs. are about to hatch, right? So I'm, I'm breaking these eggs and the kids are going, no, no, no. And I had no idea what they were screaming about. It was pretty yeah. funny. At a certain point, you've been doing this for so long, you know, you are fairly recognizable at this point. That in and of itself must be a fairly major constraint for doing some of these things. We get around it. I I don't think any of us really look famous. I I, I think I look like a pharmacist more than anything. (laughs) But uh, we get around it. What you don't realize is that taken out of context, you, you only see one of us at a time. Uh, and we're out of context. We're like last week we're working at a uh, Raising Cane's, the chicken restaurant in Brooklyn, right? And we've got hats on. We're the manager polo shirt. I have different, different glasses on. And and you're in the middle of people's real lives deep in Brooklyn. Like they just, we still get away with it to this day because of that, the very nature of the show, you know? There must be a certain percentage though that just don't make it in because you are in fact recognized from time to time. Well, it's not as much as you think. We have, we, we never, we never, discuss them in detail but we have methods that weed people out before they even get to us yep you know we like you said we've been doing this a long time so we figured out a trick or two uh but we never say what they are because we don't want people to be able to circumvent them <laughs> yeah especially in the early days when you were still figuring out some of these tricks was there anything that just have you ever had to completely scrap a thing just because it just didn't work yeah uh mimes <laughs> mimes 
I'm, we, we, yeah, it was your punishment, was, right? No, it wasn't a punishment. It was my idea. Oh. And you guys didn't want to do it. And I pushed it through, and it was a total disaster. It was uh, – I still think the bit could work. I agree. We just – we got – you got screwed by the weather. We, so we were dressed like mummies, and we had to go up to people in Central Park by Bethesda Fountain. And we had to uh, get people to guess what we were miming, and the guys were behind us holding up the sign. So you had to mime real stupid stuff. Not a bad bit. No. Yeah. On paper, it sounds great. We were dressed in all black head to toe with berets and my make like pancake. And it was 104 degrees that day. In Central Park. It was, I mean, we and were dying. within five minutes of filming, the guys and I, we were melting. I mean, it, were melting. there was no way to shoot it. And Sal started complaining so much. Remember, he was so did, angry. Did we finish the bit? Okay. No, we gave up. We, we just were like, up. fuck it, let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Went to Red Lobster. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pretty good, though. Only one really jumps to mind after that many of years of doing the show. Yeah, two. I think oh, there's only two we've ever Yeah, recorded. there's one other that we had to scrap. Oh, no, there's another one. A third we had to scrap. My Punishment Season 1, where you guys had me go to a uh, that biker bar and ride the uh, mechanical bull. Oh, yeah. I was yeah. dressed in like short shorts. It just looked like I was having too much fun, and I was. It was a blast. Oh, I forgot about <laughs> that. Yeah. And then we never aired it. Yeah. That's something that I hadn't considered, that – you appearing to enjoy the punishment would be enough reason to scrap it from the show. Yeah. Yeah. I was having an absolute blast. <laughs> Even when you're being put in a difficult situation, I, I, it, it's still a pretty amazing thing that you get to do this for a living. And then you've been yeah. able to do it for as long as you have. Well, we had uh, Bruce Campbell on, uh, and I'm like the biggest evil dead fan in the world. And, and uh, they, had me basically reenact the plot of Evil Dead 2, <laughs> what Bruce was directing me, and he made it horrible. Like, they just doused me in blood, put my face in a river, broke plates over my head. And it was really hard and miserable to do, but at the end of the day, I was like, oh, I love that this so much. Yeah, it was like you the know, best my, my, So Bruce Campbell, you know, comes on set, he's going to help us punish Q. My favorite thing he said the whole day. At the beginning of the day, I was like, Bruce, you know, we're huge fans. We grew up watching you. We love the Evil Dead movies. Yeah, I said, ha, ha, you know, you hear on the set of Impractical Jokers. Did, did you know the show before? Have you seen lots of it? He goes, never heard of the show. I was like, you've never heard of it? He goes, no, no. I said, but you're here on it today. Why would you agree to do it? He goes, you guys paid me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all yeah. right, there you go. And we- Following Bruce Campbell's career as much as I have, like that applies to I think a lot of the things that yeah. he's done over the years. Yeah. When he so the crew Campbell. loved him, man. When he left set, he rolled down the window and he looked at the director and he goes, "Say you later, jerk." And then he rolled up the window. <laughs> and, drove up. and then that night, because we shot that on Staten Island, the crew came back to my house and we were all drinking beers. There were like thirty people in my house afterwards, and uh, Bruce started texting me. He goes, I'm watching the show for the first time. After he after he had shot it, I'm watching the hotel for the first time. You guys are almost funny. And, like, <laughs> and then he was just watching, and he watched like four hours, and he kept texting, and I kept reading his text out to the crew, and yeah. we were all like doing shots and stuff like that. That's yeah, so funny. He's the man. But that was a tough thing to shoot, but it was so much fun in retrospect. It, it is that really rare occurrence where, when you meet a famous person, and they're like exactly like you think they would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's one of them. I, I, I know you get asked a lot about the uh, job jobs you had prior to, to doing this, um, you having been in television and, and you having been um, a, a firefighter, w- was there ever a point when, I, I know obviously at some point all, all four of you had to really drop it and, and go all in on this, but I, I don't, are, are you still, do you still consider, do you still have this like feeling deep down that some at some point this might just go away and that you might have to go back to your previous life? Well, I'm too old to be a fireman now. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I'm coming up on what would have been my 20-year retirement next year. Oh, no year. kidding. Yeah. Wow. Um, no, I think we've done enough at this point that, like, we could probably, after the show ends, coast, I think, for the lives. So we could just do cons or whatever. Um, we got asked to be in movies and TV shows. I, you know, I think once you've been around as long as we are, like... There's always going to be someone that, that has some interest. Isn't it in strange? It. I mean, we've been on TV 14 years now. Yeah. Right? We started filming the show two, um, May of 2010. Yeah. So, third, third, yeah. Right? And um, and it's always been year by year. Yeah. You never you, In TV, you never have any job security. It's not like, oh, I'm a company man. I've been there, you know, yeah. 18 no, years. They it's don't nothing care. like that. It's, it's every year is the same kind of stress of... Will we yeah. be on TV next year or the next year? You know what I mean? It's year by year by year. Yeah. So yeah. 
Uh, I don't know. It's kept us, uh, I guess, on our toes. Kept us on our toes. Yeah, it's. I think once they they guaranteed two seasons, and that yeah. was it. Yeah, it's wild to be the most popular show on a station and still feel like you're year to year. Yeah, it's the you know I, we could depress your audience. It's a rough business. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, gosh, we have the. Uh, 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 we're in that. My mother always said, "You don't know your golden years until you're past them." Yeah, and uh, and I think about that all the time. We have been in our golden years of the past, you know, decade yeah. plus. Yeah, you know? but we don't know what's going to come next. That's true. Well, I, mean, I know in eight days. Yeah, he, yeah. he insists that an asteroid's going to hit Earth in eight days. I've been tracking it for years. I just haven't told anyone. Did you predict the earthquake as well? Uh, I'm, it could be connected. I'll let you know. We'll we'll see, but you'll find out, and we'll see yeah. when when's that, when is that? I was uh, gonna say I've got to get this show up pretty quick. Now. I will get it up in the next eight days. Well, because the next sign is this, is the solar eclipse. That it's not coincidence, my friend. Yeah, the solar eclipse is going to affect the gravitational pull on the asteroid that's coming through our solar system as we speak. Is going to skew it slightly ever so, so it hits the keyhole. Yeah. He, the keyhole, and, and he talks like this all the time. Since he was 14 years old. <laughs> oh, he's been predicting that as- the asteroids? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. That makes me feel slightly better that you've been But right, when the end does come, it's going to be a, a wonderful tableau. <laughs> talking about being year to year and talking about the, the difficulty of uh, the television business, I'm, I'm curious how – you know, you, you, you've signed a contract for a new channel, how that changes the math for what you do. Nothing, not at all. Oh, you mean that so we, uh, we start airing on TBS? Yeah. Uh, we no. We I mean, it's 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 a sister network. We they yeah, always it's... we're always related to them, so it's just kind yeah, of yeah. And we had a show on TBS exclusively yep. Misery uh, Index. for three seasons called Misery Index. So it's it's just family. Yeah, you know? same same <laughs> different circus, same clowns. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> we're the clowns. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me just that once. <laughs>